Hello, hi. My name is David Cedic. I'm from FAO, and we'll have a, a comment for you. You know, they say that history is written by the victors, and I think that your what you've presented today takes East Asia as the model. You, I mean, that's where most of the growth is, right? I've worked in uh, Africa and um, the former Soviet Union. The growth is not like that, uh, like 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 you've been portraying it for East Asia, and I think it kind of distorts our, our view, or at least shapes our view, of the way that we think the developing world is actually developing. Um, there's a lot more, um, I mean, in fact, also East Asia um, had more of an agricultural transformation than many of the other regions. So I think that, um, I'd like to hear your comments on that, to see whether you think you've taken the victors and portrayed it as uh, a trend in the developing world. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments in the room? The gentleman here, Drew. There's a gentleman right here. Thank you, Thank you very much. I'm Vikram Nehru from Johns Hopkins University. Great to see a whole bunch of ex-World Bank colleagues uh, up here. Um, so when Will, well, there were lots of very interesting issues, and I, but I really want to make a comment on something that wasn't said, especially about the future. Uh, so when Will talked about the future, he really talked about it in terms of the impact of future policies on various aspects of convergence, productivity, demand, and so forth. Uh, but I was wondering whether the story could potentially be substantially altered as a result of the impact of climate change on agriculture and what the latest research, perhaps you could help us by telling us what the latest research shows, if it does, on how uh, these different regional uh, trends in, in productivity could potentially be substantially altered as a result of the impact of, uh, of climate change. Thank you. Wow, that is a, that's a tall order question. Um, Rob, I think you have a question over here. Mary will come to you. Um, well, I've had heard the talk before, but it's Introduce still... Introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, there's uh, Rob Foss, the Director of Markets, Trades and Institutions uh, here at IFPRI. Um, so I've had heard the talk before, but it's still interesting to pick up new things and uh, get some further reflections of what, what you said and also from the, the commentators. Uh, just one aspect which um, in the convergence story was particularly moving forward seems to be missing, uh, and I'll, I'll make it specific, right? But one is sort of uh, the distribution of natural resources and environmental constraints that, that drive the different outcomes. But let me focus on one aspect which you mentioned, uh, the links between agricultural growth and the demographic uh, dividend that Africa may have and what that means. So if we look at the the past 50 years of agricultural productivity growth, or agricultural production growth, I should say, more to the point, most of that has been driven by expanding the land frontier over the last, uh, uh, most of that period, until recently when uh, the land frontier has been more closer reached with some differences across regions. So uh, what it means is moving forward, uh, all of that have, will have to come from uh, labor productivity grows and, and land productivity grows. Um, so the question is, what would that mean for the demographic dividend that Africa might be able to to earn? Because it should mean is that, uh, on average, um, the capacity to absorb more labor in the sector as a driver also of, uh, uh, of agricultural production grows will be very limited. Uh, whereas we also know that the growth in other sectors will have to be staggeringly high in order to absorb the growth and the uh, new entrance of, of uh, young workers into the sector. So what would that mean? Uh, that's the basic question for convergence uh, in, of Africa to the rest of the world. Rob, thank you so much. Let me come back to our panel. And Will, I ask you to be the first one to respond, including any reflections on the comments here. And the mic is right in front of you. 
if you just switch it on, uh, press one, press the button. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, thank you for these wonderful comments, which are going to be really valuable uh, in in revising uh, the paper. Um, <clears throat> Louise, thanks for the comment, particularly about urban governance. I mean, I think these are hugely important. Paul Roma gave a very interesting talk, uh, touching touching on this. You know, the tendency for governments to overplan part of cities and then completely underplan um, the part where very large numbers of people live. The adverse efficiency implications of that and equity uh, implications, especially because those people are the ones who are coming in from rural areas because their opportunities are, uh, are limited there and they're seeking uh, new new opportunities. That, that, are, that process could, could really be improved a lot and that would help not just the receiving cities but also the sending um, rural areas. Hanan, great questions, comments. Um, Golan, Hansen and Wingender explain 80% of growth uh, by adoption of HYVs. Um, I, 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 I think we need to be careful whenever we're looking for a specific, we do an analysis, we look for a specific the, the, incident, the impacts of a specific uh, intervention, it's very easy to over-determine the answer. Um, Bloom and Williamson uh, attributed 40% of the uh, increase in GDP between 65 and 90, so a slightly different period, um, in East Asia to the demographic dividend. Um, so we've got now 80 plus 40. Uh, not only do we have uh, not much left to explain by trade policy, we have negative amounts to explain by anything else. So I think we need to be cautious when, when getting coefficients on specific, um, specific, specific variables. Um, but I do think there's a lot of complementarity between these different models. I mean, if you've got improved agricultural productivity, the inside of T.W. Schultz, that changes everything. It frees up a whole lot of labor. Um, then if you have policies and if you have opportunities created by global value chains, those people can move into higher earning activities. I think one of the things that's different in Africa and much more difficult in, in Africa is developing those higher earning activities outside agriculture rather than having people move out of agriculture into service activities, for instance, which, which don't involve a premium and therefore you don't get the structural transformation. I don't know that you will get the structural transformation growth without developing the higher productivity activities um, uh, outside. Yeah, the, the Africa, Africa and Latin America missing out. There was a wonderful old World Bank book, or at least, I mean, the book's great, but the title, you know, Why the Emperor's New Clothes Are Not Made in Colombia, um, <clears throat> that actually went through the policy reasons that Colombia didn't get into that first wave of labor intensive manufacturing uh, in, in, um, in, in clothing. Um, so, I, I, yeah, I, I, I'm very attracted to Richard Baldwin's point, though, that it's so much easier to develop activities, highly productive activities outside uh, agriculture. Uh, David, history written by the victors. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think the East Asian model will be completely transferable uh, 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 at all. I mean, there are lots of now activities that are well, I mean, India is, of course, a hugely di different model where that high productivity sector turned out to be services uh, outside, but where the employment implications, the employment benefits of that were much more limited than in the case of manufacturers in East Asia and right through to, you know, Bangladesh, which did very well out of clothing. Um, which was able, and clothing and other light manufacturing sectors that were enabled by people being able to move out of agriculture following improvements in product, in productivity there. Victor, on your point about different trends by region, I mean, we, we just, as I've just mentioned, there are huge, hugely different trends between regions and I think we'll, we can expect to see quite a lot of diversity. One of the things within agriculture is that Africa has vastly more exports of um, <clears throat> high value items like horticultural products and fruits 
uh, than, than other, other regions. It sees quite different sets of opportunities there. Um, and then, of course, there are opportunities in services. So I think we are going to see some very, very different uh, trends. And then, Rob, your point about natural resources. Um, yeah, I, I, the, Africa does have some some land that uh, some potential to expand land, but there will be a lot of, of job need need to create employment in, in agriculture. And Louise, I know, has touched on that in, in some of her earlier work. So I'll let her talk about that. Wonderful. Would you pass the mic to Louise? And uh... Great. Um, well, I think I will just uh, touch on, um, on Rob's point because I'm not really an expert on the impact of climate change on agriculture, that's for sure. Um, so, First thing I would say, Rob, is I, I personally, this is a personal view, think it's highly unlikely that Africa will ex have any demographic dividend or what they get will be very small. And the reason is, is that many people fail to appreciate that the size of the dividend depends not only on the change but the rate of change. So you can prove that mathematically, but just think of it intuitively that if you get a small pay raise of you know, 50 cents more per month, that doesn't really change your behavior. You don't save more. If you get a big pay raise of um, you know, $1,000 a month, you might end up saving more. And the demographic dividend is, is first of all about saving, public and private savings. Um, and so, uh, and about behavior change of households and uh, the public sector and, and the um, and effects of that. It's also enabled by investments, public investments, but it's really about behavior change. And so Africa is changing so slowly, most countries, that most countries will not see uh, a dividend the way China did or East Asia that changed, Thailand, for example, that changed very rapidly. So now you ask the question, where will labor be absorbed? Well, we've had this discussion a bit before. We know, you and I know, that our colleagues from uh, Michigan State University are really optimistic about the agro-food system and the development of agro-industry and how it's going to um, absorb uh, labor. Um, and um, I am less optimistic, uh, and I think because of the large amount of labor that needs to be absorbed, but also because when you have a population growing at that pace, it's very difficult to raise the human capital of the population at the rate that is needed, given the changing nature of work and the change in technology. So it kind of could be a vicious circle. So I think uh, for the next, I'm afraid that I think for the next 30 years, Africa will continue, Sub-Saharan Africa, many countries in Sub-Saharan Africa will continue to struggle in a low earnings environment. Um, that, but there is heterogeneity again. Um, so we shall see. Luis, thank you. Hanan, you'd be next. You can either take the mic or the other one. Whichever. Yeah. Um, okay, I, I have a couple random points um, on the climate change question I think um, well there's a, there's a study by Dave Donaldson which looks at the whole world and seems to find that all these uh, effects will kind of wash out there'll be um, uh, no net production effect uh, uh, but I think that of of course, that glosses over the uh, distributional <laughs> uh, implications. And uh, for countries in uh, like India, um, yeah, I think it's going to be a, a big issue. Um, uh, well, actually, what I also wanted to say um, regarding r uh, natural resources and so on is that um, Will hasn't said anything about uh, water. Um, which of course is just as critical as, as uh, land. Um, and uh, uh, whereas in Africa, there are plenty of water resources, um, uh, the, these resources are, are uh, definitely hitting the, the constraint in, in uh, South Asia and probably in Middle East as well. And uh, one of the things, uh, and of course, using these uh, 
modern seed varieties and so on requires controlled irrigation, all that kind of stuff. So that was the really the impetus of the green revolution that I that I mentioned was was the control of irrigation. So uh, going forward, um, the issue will be how how does water productivity grow, um, and will will you know more water water uh, conserving irrigation methods be widely adopted? Uh, in fact, that's one. Just to make a small plug, that's one thing I'm looking at um, <laughs> at, at the moment. <laughs> so uh, we'll, we shall see. Thank you very much, Hanan. Daria, there is a mic right next to you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Uh, maybe just one little po uh, point about the urban governance uh, uh, point by Luis before. I agree that it's very important. Um, so one aspect from this glob global value chain literature is really that uh, these global value chains go where there are large pools of skills. So they will try, it, we, they will tend to conglomerate around the cities in the developing countries. And so this urban governance and even more importantly the linkages with the rural areas will be fundamental to work out in order to make sure that the gains are um, in a, uh, shared in, a, in, in an equal, in a more equitable way. Daria, thank you so much. Let me come back to the room. Uh, and Jason, there are no online questions at this time. Okay, that allows us. Um, as I come back to the room for a moment, uh, well, I myself have a, co a comment, a question to put on the table along with everyone else. Because I'm very curious on this technological change question that was raised. And I'm wondering, going forward, that the pace of technological change seems to be accelerating. Will that have any implications also to consider um, as you're looking at the convergence? But let me come back to the room. Questions, comments, your own views, insights, don't be shy. And I notice our colleagues here are working on climate change, on urban issues. If they also want to come in, they will come in. My goodness, this is a rare moment. Okay, thank you so much. There's a, yeah, a young lady there. Thanks, um, Claire from Institute of Development Studies. Just wondering if you could expand on the political economy point that you made. Um, is there any chance of a country, as we've seen in India, they were exporting food during a time of famine. Will we ever see this happen again? Hopefully not. Hmm. That's a very interesting and provocative question. Let me come back. Do you, uh, do you, would you like to address that, Will? Sure. Uh, well, um, uh, your, there's, um, your point as well, right, Joel, yeah. about the rate of technological change. Uh, I think that's a, that's a very interesting uh, one because you know, Robert Gordon is arguing that what we're dealing with now is tiddlywinks by comparison, is very small increments of, pro of productivity growth relative to the really big stuff, you know, like the internal combustion engine, um, the, the water closet, uh, and, uh, and other inventions of the late 19th century, early 20th. Um, <clears throat> I, I, my sense is things like CRISPR could be huge uh, in, for agriculture going forward. I mean, what that allows, you know, is, is GMOs, is, you know, is much larger than, than GMOs. And, and it should be much less controversial because it doesn't have to involve Im importing genes from um, uh, Frankenstein or any other things that would cause fear and trembling. Although a, a recent court decision in Europe has made, uh, has put it in the wrong category, it seems to me. Um, but so I think there could be quite a lot of productivity growth. If you ask Elon Musk as well, you know, we could all be living, uh, our grandchildren could all be living on Mars. But, uh, you know, there's still quite a bit of scope for productivity growth. And I think we always tend to underestimate the scope for productivity growth <laughs> in, the, in the future. Who was, there was a chairman of the patent commission here once who said that everything that, you know, could be invented had already been invented. And that was in 1880 or, <laughs> or something in this, in this very city. Um, the political economy uh, point, um, you know, the whole sort of, uh, you know, Matthias Sen's book deserves reading and rereading. You know, it's, it's enormously powerful. But his point about once you focus on availability, rather than on whether people can get access to food, you end up making 
you know, the wrong decisions. You know, in, in the 1943 Bengal famine, the wrong decision was to say, well, there is enough food because the harvest is about the same, um, and to not allow any imports. You have a quantitative ban on imports. Um, you know, I recently did some work on, on Zambia where the authorities expected a decline in the harvest for political reasons they put on an export ban. There wasn't actually a decline in the harvest. Uh, the prices um, went down. Some farmers had declines in their harvest and others didn't. But it turned out that the way it worked was that a lot of farmers did have a decline in yields. Um, they had less to sell. They were net sellers, quite poor net sellers, and then the decline in prices that resulted from this policy exacerbated the adverse impacts of the original shock. Uh, you know, you, you've got to, for food security, you've got to be thinking about uh, ac access to food. You know, there's the, the, the Donaldson uh, and Bur Burgess and Donaldson have this very simple paper looking at India when the railroads came. Um, now, you bring in a railroad, that's, you know, that lowers transport costs by a factor of 10, um, you suddenly get transport. And you could get rich people outside pulling food out of poor areas. But in fact, what you get is you, you get uh, offset to the volatility of local production and you get reductions in the frequency of famines. You know, the, the, that ability to trade means that food is actually goes to people uh, who need it. Now that, that's sort of conditional on you know, some sort of ability to finance it and so on. But, but they, they, we're, you know, that Burgess and Donaldson study is talking about colonial India with very, very poorly developed finance and so on. So focusing on access for food security. I mean, just as a recent example, in 2008, India put on an export ban on on exports of grain, but wheat and, and, uh, and rice, um, it ended up accumulating massive stocks it didn't want or need, um, but it took policymakers a long time to take that ban off. And to stop the price, domestic price going through the floor, the government had to buy all these enormous amounts of grain. So all of these kinds of policies that focus on availability tend to actually create more food security problems uh, than, than they solve. And, you know, Amartya Sen, read Amartya Sen's Poverty and Famines, I think, is, a, is always a good guide. Any of the panelists want to reflect? Uh, well, I, I do want to uh, note that in especially smaller countries, uh, you know, the World Bank did some work about 10 years ago about uh, in Eastern and Southern Africa, um, how countries, parts of countries would be better off op importing and exporting from each other um, then, for example, uh, northern Mozambique is really much more connected with the southern Africa agricultural basin than southern Mozambique and trying to close off and then get the food from uh, southern and central Mozambique up north compared to just getting it from Tanzania made no sense. So I think um, that I is another element. I mean, India is a big country, but for smaller countries uh, and um, where, uh, you know, thinking about the basin, the food basin in the neighborhood uh, obviously makes a lot of sense. But I want to ask Daria a question. So um, great presentation about global value chains and why they're a, a, a game changer. Can we think about about the future of global value chains in agriculture and what will matter for the countries that have so far uh, not participated to participate. Now, is it going to be the ports and the logistics and the roads? Or is it going to be, I always think back to Chile and why Chile was so successful, which was the government, uh, and this was a government that d didn't believe much in government in the economy, but they clearly understood the role of um, inspections and standards. Uh, for exports so that they could get their uh, grapes and all their uh, other stuff um, uh, into the U.S. So what do you think is uh, really going to matter for agricultural global value chains in the future? Super, Louise. Daria, would you like to go ahead and respond? Sure, thank you. Um, I think for uh, countries at a different level of development, there will be different things. Uh, I think for countries that are um, uh, at the lowest level of development, 
a big binding constraint is that um, there is not enough demand and supply. And so uh, we need to find ways to aggregate demand and supply and uh, so to create minimum volumes, this minimum scale, so that, uh, that uh, trade can actually go there. Um, for uh, countries at higher levels of development, then other things become uh, Im more important. But I see it as a continuum where at the beginning you really need to, to take care of that. And then as you move towards, um, let's say, higher levels of development, standards, managerial practices, uh, uh, ability to, uh, to efficiently um, integrate supply chains, um, human capital, but of different type uh, at different levels of development is needed. Um, uh, trade agreements, deep trade agreements, obviously. And so you need the whole, I think it's a process to join global value chains and to be successful. It's a never ending um, the effort. It's not a one off uh, um, thing to do. Daria, thank you so much. I come to any final, uh, and I see Keith, your hand, any final questions or comments, and then I'll come back to the panel and also ask them to wrap up. Keith? Thanks, Rajul. I'll take your invitation to say a bit more about climate change. I'm Keith Wiebe from IFPRI here. Uh, we've done some work looking at the impacts of climate change on agricultural productivity, and as Hanan said, when you look at the aggregate scale, the positives tend to wash out with the negatives, but that masks a lot of really important variation. There is, to simplify very broadly, a uh, higher impact at lower latitudes, so in the tropical countries, and to the extent that that corresponds with developing countries, that would suggest that that would uh, slow down the trend toward convergence, but that can be offset importantly by management practices and precision application of, of inputs and uh, water management and so forth. But then again, that too, there's a, a distinction between the level of that uh, access to inputs and management and so forth in the rich countries versus the poor countries. So a question, I guess, would be whether that you see that uh, pattern continuing to converge or to diverge over time, and that's a matter of uh, policies and investments choices that we make today. Super. Thank you, Keith. Did I? There's a hand right at the very back, uh, Drew. Hi, my name is Julie. I work here at FPRI. I was wondering about um, what kind of consideration is given to some of the potential social externalities, whether positive or negative, that come as, especially as. Uh, new areas start participating in global value chains or opening, changing trading agreements. And one of the things that makes me ask this question is thinking about even the the emphasis on local agriculture here in the U.S. and that's looked to as a sort of paragon of, of building local strength and strength, strength within communities and interdependency. And I'm wondering how that translates or doesn't translates uh, doesn't translate to other parts of the world. Thank you very much. I'd like to come to the panel and ask you also, as you make your final remarks, to take up uh, the point that Will made at the end of his presentation, exciting new research areas, the potential. And I'm also curious, as you make your final remarks, where would you like to see uh, new, uh, um, new research areas examined? And I want to do it in reverse order to give Will the final word. Daria, may I begin with you and then work towards Hanan, Louise, and then Will? Any reflections and any thoughts on your closing remarks? Actually, I'm not ready. Okay. <laughs> Hanan, would you like to uh, come in? Uh, yeah. Um, well, I think in keeping with Will's uh, themes of, of, of his talk and, and, and his lifelong uh, work, <laughs> I think that what we really need is um, a better understanding of the link between, which is what I said before, actually between trade um, and uh, growth and poverty reduction. And I think uh, if, if I look at the literature in, in economics on, on this question, um, uh, it's, first of all, it's a bit dated. Um, doesn't really capture what's happened uh, in the last 20 years, which, which I think was Will's focus. Um, and what's out there often leaves me, you know, is head scratching. Uh, 
on some of these things. So uh, I won't go into the specific studies that I have in mind, but I really think that this is an area um, that needs to be uh, addressed and um, obviously uh, is critical for policy. Okay, well, the own work agenda coming up at Louise. I think my agenda really is around uh, helping um, understand, demonstrate, uh, work with, and try to get better policies around the opportunities that new agricultural technology is bringing for employment and earnings in rural areas and what's needed to make that happen, including the rural-urban connections, um, and because, of course, there will uh, the cities are uh, a demand sink. I think there's a lot of focus in uh, in many for many countries on exports and the opportunity that uh, poorer countries have to export because richer countries have such a small agricultural sector. Uh, but actually, that overlooks the important role of local demand that Will's uh, chart so beautifully illustrated. And if we think about that history and what role the um, uh, moving toward more calorie-intensive foods has played in the development of the agricultural sector in the currently rich countries, but the newly uh, emerging countries, and think about what lessons that then has for uh, the poorer countries, um, I think that's where we need uh, perhaps more work. Thank you so much, Louise. Daria, may I come back to you now? Yeah. Thank you. You took me by surprise before. <laughs> Um, yeah, maybe um, just uh, staying in this theme of um, how we can leverage the global value chains. I think uh, um, really thinking uh, through how to exploit buyer power, the fact that we have large corporations that move a lot of the demand, and we have consumers, especially in developed countries, uh, that have um, sophisticated demand. They want social impact, they want environmental impact out of that. And I think there is a lot to study on how to make sure that this translates into their balance sheet so that translates to demand from uh, their shareholders to investors and finally uh, it can trickle down the entire supply chain. There is a lot moving but I think there is a lot to do on that area. Daria, thank you so much. Will, you have the final word reflecting on anything you wish to reflect on. Great. Uh, thank you very much. I mean, I think one thing we really want to remember is what a remarkable period the last 25 years and has been. You know, if you go back into the in the 1980s, you just at the, had the end of this very long period where developing countries progressively slipped further and further behind. If you read some of the old addresses, you know, Arthur Lewis's talk to the Elmhurst lecture. Uh, at the international conference, you know, it was really about whether developed countries, the rich countries, would grow fast enough to create the demand for developing countries to get an expansion in their exports. You know, there was a, a very fundamental pessimism about whether developing countries could succeed in exports, um, whether productivity could grow. You know, the, the prospects for poverty reduction looked absolutely terrible. Um, you know, 40% of the world's population was poor. You know, now we come out of that process, the World Bank has just released its latest estimates that world poverty is now at 8%. Um, you know, that's still way too high, and most of those poor people are in rural areas, but, um, you know, it's one-fifth the share that it, that it was uh, 25 years ago. So. Um, you know, the whole notion that the, it's the rich countries that grow faster and the poor countries that have to seize, you know, crumbs of opportunity, that's, that's absolutely changed. And this is, you know, hugely, hugely important. Um, part of it has come from improvements in agricultural productivity that have, that have made it no longer necessary for 80% of the world's workforce to be in agriculture producing the bare uh, requirements um, of staple food. So, you know, this is absolutely wonderful 
um, you know, magical transformation of the world. There are lots and lots of problems um, the, that remain. You know, it, it, the, uh, the problem is one problem that David identified is that so much of the growth is in one particular region, East, East and South Asia, um, you know, Asia more generally, uh, and the, the problems of Africa uh, are huge and are going to be with us for a very long time, partly because of the, 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 the uh, <coughs> vicious cycles that are associated. If you don't get more rapid growth, you don't get more rapid falls in fertility, you don't get the opportunity to, to raise education rates. Although in the paper, you know, I, I do find many countries in Africa expanding access to education in rural areas much, much more rapidly than others. Kenya, for instance, is... Yep, 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 yep. But at least, at least there is something there. I agree. Better than, yeah. So, so I mean, there's, you know, huge change, huge progress. I, I think that there's a lot of cause for optimism. There's a lot of new research agendas. I mean, the whole nutrition agenda is absolutely transformed and one where IFPRI has a, a, a key role to play. Um, and I think, yeah, so we, we shouldn't be too pessimistic, but nor should we become complacent, especially when you see the, the shocks um, to, to the new global trading system that we're seeing now. Thank you very much, Will. Before I ask all of you to join me in thanking our wonderful panel, I will make one advertisement. We have three equally exciting events next week. Uh, the launch of a new book by Ray Goldberg, the father of agribusiness on Monday, uh, event on Nigeria's coal chain that Rob Voss is moderating on Tuesday, and an event on the study of the commons and, the, and the, to kick off the commons week on Thursday. So if you enjoyed this one, come back for those. But at this moment, please join me in thanking our panelists here. Thank you so much. <laughs>